Hello and welcome to our webinar, which is a video cast today. I'm Gene Tindall with Hopkins International, and with me is my friend and colleague Doug Kane uh, with One Network. We're happy you tuned in today because we have a very important topic to discuss. It's reducing lead times, or as we will refer to it as uh, data latency, the silent killer for supply chains. Uh, we wanted to design this for especially for consumer electronics companies because of the special needs of the supply chains of this product. It obviously will work, as you will see, for any consumer products company that sells, especially through retail. You know, there's a lot of issues out there around um, supply chain effectiveness, and one of them is indeed time. Everybody wants more speed today. And we see things like uh, speed to market, speed to uh, benefit. I even saw one recently, time to insight. So the question is, how long does it take to get some insight out of big data or something like that? So really is a, a lot of interest in speed, and we're going to really address that, that kind of issue today because it's not really been solved so well yet. I thought I'd start with the context of why this is so important and refer to the seven top priorities for consumer electronics supply chains in this year, uh, which we have come up with and, and talked about. One is adhere to the right operation strategy. Uh, consumer electronics companies have been big innovators in supply chains over the past, um, but the question is now with all the changes in the market and competition and so on, do we really have the right operational strategy uh, to really make sure we're, we're winners in our markets? Second is operate effective business processes with talented people. Um, business processes are continually being changed as they should be and with new information and new uh, things to, and tools to work with, uh, we do need to keep challenging our business processes. Third is integrate business planning and ex execution. We see this more and more because planning has become uh, a lot better for us, but execution tends to, to still fall out of the, the game so well and is not integrated as well as it should. And here comes four that we really will address today. Fourth is operate in demand-driven value networks. We talk about demand-driven because it is clearly the new way of op operating your supply chains and your value chains is making sure you know what is selling uh, before you push out products that aren't. So we'll talk about demand-driven. Fifth is optimize logistics. You you really do need the logistics of your supply chain to work in its best possible way if we're going to, uh, to, to win in the marketplace. Six is adopt new powerful technologies. And you'll hear about uh, one today from Doug especially on some new powerful technology that really gets at this question of lead time and uh, that's part of the, the agenda here. And seven, proactively manage supply chain risks. You know, because too often we react to things like out of stock or react to things that happen that we weren't forecasting. Uh, variability and so on is very important. So keep those seven supply chain priorities in mind as we go through our webinar. And we're, as I said, we're going to address several of them as we go through. You know, demand-driven supply chains, as I said, is our view of how supply chains need to work in this era of, of the industry. Consumer electronics, consumer products, all sorts of products need to turn their mindsets around from creating a product and pushing it out there to finding out what's selling and working it back. So with that introduction, I'm going to ask Doug to, to drill into a little bit now about what is the anatomy of, of lead times and how we see lead times impacting supply chains. Uh, thanks, Gene. You know, from a lead time standpoint, um, high-tech supply chains tend to have much longer lead times due to the fact that a lot of production and manufacturing is done in Asia. And you've got the long ocean, ocean freight time and so forth. Um, so it's a little different than a lot of other, uh, other industries. And, because of that, that actually introduces a lot of different variability from the supply side, um, and then also from the demand side. Because if you're if you've got a four week time to build, put it on the ocean, and get it over, the demand picture that you see a month from now may not be what it was when you were initially forecasting. So, 
from a, the standpoint of lead time, the, the physical lead time is how much, or how much time does it actually take to go from point A to point B, a truck, a plane, a car, or a truck, plane, boat, and so forth. But then the silent killer is what we call system lead time. And system lead time in a traditional supply chain, you know, you usually, as the name chain would imply, it's really a point to point. So you're really connected from you know, the next person back in your chain, right? So what, what has happened over time is you've got this point to point connections and it'll be their human interactions, there's some EDI transactions, some transactions going back and forth. But at each, at each level as you go through the chain, there's more and more system lead time in, in, introduced. And in this uh, particular example, we show physical lead time from getting out from supplier through manufacturing and out to the stores, it's roughly 33 days of physical lead time. Mm -hmm. The system lead time, or the time it takes to actually communicate between each one of these links is 29 days. Wow. Based on this particular example, we're showing lead times of roughly 33 days of physical lead time, 29 days of actual lead time. So the total lead time is actually 62 days. You start adding in buffers at each location and all of a sudden your chain line inventory becomes, you know, more than 70 days of, of stock. Wow. I mean, you're carrying high, high valued inventory and so forth and combine that with short product life cycles, what, character, what typically happens is you end up in either an under, under supply for the types of products that, um, that are fast selling or you've got way too much of the stuff that isn't selling, then you end up having to get rid of them or basically reduce the price and, and dump them. At the end so of the I understand cycle. there's physical limits or let's say requirements. So you could fly, you could do air cargo and cut out some ocean time, which of course some companies do. But other than that, there is physical time that it's actually taking to move the product. Correct. But the system lead time is that created by people or processes or systems that make it move from end to end. Yeah, yeah basically that uh, is what we would define as the system based lead oh. time. So, you know, in this example, and it's uh, backed by several studies that 40 or more percent of a total supply chain lead time is in system lead time. Well, if you can reduce that system lead time to basically real time, yeah. that cuts out 29 days right there, mm -hmm. you know, in this example was at roughly 45% mm -hmm. of the chain wide inventory. Wow. So it's got significant value and it's certainly worth considering and trying to figure out how do we get rid of that uh, system based lead time. Well I think I understand now the, the problem, that is we've got a lot of this time in there caused by inefficiency, work, uncertainty, people transactional stuff, all the stuff that goes, especially from one company to another, but even within a company, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, merchandising may be ordering a product, supply chain is moving it, and they're wondering where, who has ownership of it and all that sort of thing. So I understand that's still a problem in most supply chains, especially international ones, but even in domestic ones. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's not... It, when you move it into the realm of high tech, because of those long lead times, that yeah. just increases the variability, um, which obviously you end up buffering against variability, yeah. and that's what leads companies to have such excess inventory, or if they're not properly forecasting, we'll talk a little bit about that, but you want to recognize what's actually being consumed and build to what that consumption is, not build to a statistical forecast that may not have any basis in reality. Okay. Okay. Especially 70 some days later. Yeah, well, yeah, it would be exactly. I mean, it, right. You know, we've talked about demand driven and the importance of demand driven. And of course, people, that's been on people's minds for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it means a lot of different things mm -hmm. to different people. But from our standpoint, what we look at is what is the forward most consumption or the point of consumption right. that you can. Uh, that you can gather in a systematic format. Mm -hmm. In several cases, it's the actual POS data or orders that are coming in via the, via the web. Mm -hmm. At other 
places it might be at a DC level, so the retailer DC out to the store. And in some cases, it's you know from the manufacturer or brand owner's DC out out to the um, out to the retailer out to the channels. Mm -hmm. So in a demand-driven world, though, you know if you if you're forecasting out with you know these five, six, seven week lead times, what tends to happen is if you're not looking at that actual demand, you're building to a forecast, and on one end you're filling up this, call it the floating warehouse, so it's, you're filling up these containers right. with stuff that, that may not be relevant to what's actually selling, right? So as you can start recognizing um, in real time what, what is actually selling at that, at that time, now you start feeding back and once you've removed the system of base lead time, if you can communicate that back to your um, back to your uh, manufacturing partners or contract manufacturers right. or the EMS providers in uh, the high tech world, then they can start building the right product mix because you know you're going to put it on a boat and it's going to take three to four weeks to get over here. Yeah. If you put in the wrong, if you keep filling that floating warehouse with the wrong product, yeah. you're going to be stuck with it when it gets back out here on the other side, whether it's finished goods or whether it's in Mexico to, for postponement, right. Right. it's still a wrong product. Now the, on the flip side too is as if you recognize what's actually being consumed. So on one end we're helping build the product, the right product mix back in Asia. Is that just coming over now, as we said of course, the demand picture four weeks after this thing has been on the boat may be completely different than what you, what you thought. And so uh, one of the things that you want a system to do and as you look at uh, supply supply chain orchestration uh, versus collaboration, you want enough intelligence and uh, engines, uh, visibility and uh, planning and execution engines in a solution that would be able to understand, okay, where, where are the different points of my inventory? What do I have in, what does the retailer have at the store? What does the retailer have at the DC? What do I have in my as a brand owner, what do I have in my DC? Uh -huh. What's on its way inbound from Asia? Uh -huh. And then as you're consuming in real time what's actually selling, there, there's no reason to allocate that inventory on the boat until it actually gets here and you know where it really needs to go. You know, so for instance, you may have a region for some, you know, for some reason a region may, um, you know, an office depot might have just completely sold a whole bunch of HP products, right? Yeah. Well, it was completely unforecasted, and four or six weeks ago when they were yeah. building that, they had no idea. Yeah. Well, you know, real time in a demand driven uh, value network, they can start seeing that inventory and they know they've got a problem here, and they can make those deployment decisions, delay those deployment decisions yeah. right. until the very end. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Let me restate it. Because it also involves supplier variability, which we know is out there on a lot of the high tech world, especially. If you have a better certainty on what you're going to build, that helps that. And then better certainty on where it's going to be deployed, even better. By the way, I can't help to say that I was a former naval officer. You, it's not a boat, it's a ship. So, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> and people that know me that know the naval officer can say, what did you let him say boat for? And my sister's a naval officer as well, a okay. naval chaplain. Okay. I guess I'll just call me Gilligan. You've got these, what, may, what we might call safety stocks in the system. Mm -hmm. So keep on that subject for a moment. Well, yeah, so, I mean, safety stock is always a function of what the, um, well, it's a function of variability, but also of the total lead time. So yeah. the longer the lead time, the more buffer stock you have. And over time, as you, as you implement demand-driven solution, yeah. you're, as, the, as the lead times go down, as you remove system-based lead time, uh, and there's actually a project we've got going on with one network in conjunction with the uh, uh, University of North Texas, which is to define what the theoretical minimums of moving something across the entire supply chain. Okay. But the closer you can get to those theoretical minimums, the less inventory you have to carry at any stage in that node, which is basically how you optimize what your inventory levels should be. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, but also because of being able to react in real time to what's actually happening by having visibility to what you've got coming in, you can optimize your customer service level. So it's, I mean, the old paradigm of, 
let's build enough so that we can keep our customer service levels at a certain right. age. Well, you know, they're at a certain level. Well, that right. made sense, but companies, I mean, cost pressures, competitive pressures are causing companies to look at, you know, we need to free up working capital. One way to do that is let's lower our inventories. Yeah. Well, we don't want to lower our inventories because then our customer service levels will go down. Yeah. Well, guess what? We've, the, um, by having an underlying IT architecture that uh, can support a whole real-time value network, yeah. we can do both. We need to minimize your inventories and bring up customer service levels. Okay, so I get the problem and the opportunity, and you touched on a network of some type of technology. Can you now go into what that is and how that helps them reduce lead times? So what you really need is a network-based platform that's multi-enterprise, mm -hmm. that can sit across um, multiple enterprises and have many-to-many -many network connections, which means that basically anyone on Anyone on the network, you can choose to connect to them to become a trading partner, right? So this, if you think of this plat this multi-enterprise platform layer that would give you visibility and allow for permissibility, all of your trading partners to access information in real time, that gives you the, the visibility, foundation, and so forth to build upon. You know, from a platform layer, you know, as the cloud has emerged as a uh, as a much more viable, a viable solution, and it's certainly starting to get um, adoption in the business community. Mm -hmm. So you know things like Facebook and LinkedIn and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you can see the power of mm -hmm. those types of solutions. So if you can kind of think of again that the supply chain isn't really a chain; it's just a community of trading partners mm -hmm. that are in a network fashion. Right. And so if you think of the Facebook or LinkedIn example, if you can put a cloud layer on top of all these multiple enterprises and then simply represent that company at once, so if you use the Facebook analogy, the company would, um, would basic, basically onboard once, that's their company profile, right? Mm -hmm. And then would, they would then look at uh, all the trading partners that they would want to communicate with and the Facebook terminology, a friend request them that they give you back. Mm -hmm. And then so and then on top of this platform layer, now you can start taking the different supply chain and value network solutions across logistics and so forth and use that to optimize and have that instantaneous data data flow. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the whole right once mentality versus having to have multiple instances and so forth. Let me clarify trading partners or ask mm -hmm. you, let's say I make tablets. Okay. I'm the brand tablet brand. I may have contract yeah, have I may have contract manufacturers. I may have, I certainly have suppliers of components. Mm -hmm. I probably have logistics companies helping me move it from wherever it's being assembled or made. Mm -hmm. Then I'm probably selling it through at least one channel would be through a retailer. Mm -hmm. So all those organizations are trading partners in our definition. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, okay. depending on where you are in the overall ecosystem, you've got just take a, a brand owner yeah. um, or OEM, yeah. um, you know, their ecosystem from the demand partner side would be any of their channel partners. So, I mean, it could be direct via the internet, it could be through retail, through distributors and bars and so forth. So okay. that would be kind of their, right. that'd be their trading, um, that'd be their trading partners on the demand side. On the supply side, yeah. it would be their contract manufacturing, the component suppliers and basically anything that's anything that's going into the product that they're turning around and selling to their demand community. Okay. And then of course all the logistics that go with then moving it between okay. all the different points. So yeah, so So tip and typically they all have different systems, right? Doing yes. their so, and so yes, that's you so how up they, a good point. How do they suddenly get on the same one? Well there's a great point that uh, um, one of the one of the critical things that that you need to understand, or that everyone needs to understand, and quite frankly, everyone understands this, but it becomes a problem. Companies have gone and have spent large amounts of money develop, or, uh, implementing ERP solutions and other solutions that fit within what we call for their, themselves. For their four walls, right? right? Okay. And you know that's great. I mean, in some cases, you know, companies have had 
to like multiple ERPs within their company and so forth. But that doesn't give them that ability to communicate with any of their partners in, in a single platform. And so this, when I talk about this multi-enterprise platform, you can think of it as this layer that sits atop the, um, that sits atop all, this com all the company's internal legacy systems, okay. ERP systems, and so forth. Right. And then, actually a good analogy we've heard from one of our customers is, you know, if you look at the supply chain ecosystem, or the, man the manufacturing ecosystem, uh, the ERP system's like the elephant. It's big, slow, it doesn't move very fast, but you give it information, it never forgets. Mm -hmm. Whereas one network is the real time, it's a cheetah yeah. where it can respond and uh, you know it responds on a dime, makes decisions quickly, and then synchronizes back down into that system. Uh, in conjunction with that uh, technology and that platform layer, multi-enterprise platform layer, is what we call a tunable system of control. So if you can imagine that uh, the hundreds of trading partners that you have and your da demand community, your supply community, as well as your uh, logistics community all have their own instances or multiple instances of ERP and several other legacy systems that they're using internally for to run their business. So again, we've the first piece being the layer atop all of those, but the second piece, what the tunable system of control allows, is for you to model an end-to-end -end process that would uh, take the flow from one a transaction from the beginning of this life cycle all the way to the end of its life cycle. And in the cases where um, a, a certain internal system to a company needs to be the execution mechanism, we basically send a signal and say, okay, you do the execution on this, and then when it's done, we move on to the next step. Uh, in the cases where there may be gaps, we have all the planning and execution engines that one network can actually um, when network can actually perform those functions and then move it on as it moves across to the end of the life cycle of that particular transaction. So, it, you know, in in the real world, you, you have to you have, have to understand that there's all these different systems, and so the integration to them needs to be easy, and it needs to allow for companies to continue to use what they the, the systems that work well and use the one network solution to fill in the gaps where it doesn't and also use one network as a communication vehicle across all of those and we we've really adopted a philosophy of embrace not replace so even though there's a lot of things that uh, that the platform can do from a planning and execution side uh, we, we want to take a look at what works well for the company what doesn't and um, embrace what does and integrate and pass information back and forth and where it doesn't um, and where we can fill the gaps we would uh, also do that so that's um, from a tunable system of control we think that's absolutely critical just because of the nature of the way businesses operate today it's not all going to change to a network model so we've got to adapt to uh, to the way the way the business works uh, the third the third piece, um, and you'll actually see a, a chart here which kind of follows the supply chain maturity model um, that Gartner has put out all the way from stage one where you're reacting up to stage four of orchestrating. And so the, the third area that is very important is this concept of sense and respond, a real-time sense and respond. A lot of technologies say they have real-time sense and respond. What you know, what that actually means is, yes, we've got real-time sense, and the response mechanism is I alert the users that something has changed. Now you have to go do something. So I've broken that out as to be real-time sense, manual response. Okay. And as you move up, as you get to an orchestration model, which is a, which is the highest level of maturity, I've 
try to differentiate for people to understand that all technologies other than one network have this real-time sense automated response. One net, or I'm sorry, real-time sense manual response. One network provides what we call real-time sense and automated response. An analogy might be, you know, if I use the maturity model, um, in human maturity as an adult, when you sense that you're hungry, your automated response is to eat. But uh, when you weren't so mature as a child, you sense that you're hungry and you start crying and that becomes the alert mechanism which actually causes your parents to have to do some sort of human interaction to feed you and so forth. So, so if you can imagine in, um, in a solution where something within the supply chain changes, we recognize that that changes and then our execution and engines will be continuously and incrementally looking for those changes and then recomputing what the optimal response is to those based on your business rules. If you go back to my, my human analogy, so the automated response may be to eat, but you know, a highly tuned athlete, his business rules may be to eat something that's healthy, whereas my business rules might be go to McDonald's. So it may be a little corny of an analogy there, but the whole point is that within the solution, and if you ever want to get to the orchestration level within the supply chain, the technology needs to be intelligent enough, have the execution and planning engines to recognize what, what the change has been, and in real time do a re-plan and re-execute to basically give you an optimal response. So you know, in, in the context, as, as I've talked about the importance of real-time sensing with an automated response, when I tie it back to the purpose of the discussion, if you could imagine that you know, the system-based lead time is a factor of either you know, the human interaction or the amount of time it takes for a problem to be resolved, to the extent that you can automate the responses will significantly remove uh, system-based lead time. So, so, so if you can understand the value of being able to continuously monitor uh, monitor for changes or look for changes and then replan and re-execute in real time, you start to see that the, the solution gets you to again that work or to the orchestration model, um, which is the highest level of supply chain maturity, which I'll talk about here in the next uh, in the next piece. So you can really start thinking about the technology as being a decision making solution versus a decision support solution. Obviously decision support has been a buzzword for a while and there's some solutions that help you make better decisions but it still require humans to make those decisions. The idea in, by bringing in this continuous uh, planning and execution the intelligence within the system will actually make those decisions. I didn't didn't talk about the incremental piece and why that's important is if you can imagine the complexity of lots of uh, all the trading partners and all the interconnections and so forth uh, a particular change may not affect every trading partner so um, so it's very important that if the system be able to understand that okay it's a particular change has happened who are the parties that are affected and how, how do we alert them or how do we solve that problem but not broadcast it across the entire network so that you have to replan 50 million inventory buffers when it's only affecting one particular location. Okay, Doug, thanks for that uh, good discussion of the technology. Um, let me ask this question because as we know, high-tech companies especially are not all about replenishment. There are new products all the time because product life cycles are, are less and and uh, to keep an advantage of the market, people, especially these days, want new products all the time, smartphones, computers, tablets, so on. So how, how does uh, data latency Im get impacted in that process? Uh, that's a, it's a real good point because we've, what we've been focusing on as far as reducing system lead time is taking a look at forward most consumption or forward most 
consumption and propagating that backwards. So what do you do when you're introducing a new product where you have no no forward consumption at that good, point, right? Good. And so you know, it brings up a very good uh, topic around the whole integrated business planning process, which includes things like new product introduction, and then typically on the you know on the back side of the new product introduction is what it's replacing. So how is how is the new product introduction? And how is the other one going to be end of life? How can you forecast smooth and so forth? So Thanks. Uh, oh, I, you know, you know, and I'm sorry. Actually, I brought up another point, which is very critical is in the whole promotional planning promotion. piece. Yeah. Um, and so it, I mean, it would seem very obvious that in a promotional time, understanding what's actually being consumed is very, very critical. Yeah, yeah. And as part of that whole integrated business planning process, um, being able to plan for the different uh, promotions and so forth right. is very critical. And then measure how those, you know, measure how those uh, promotions actually did against those uh, against those forecasts, and that, those, like I said, those, I want to get into the technology pieces that are necessary to reduce overall system lead time. But you know, if, if we go back to the discussion about having this multi-enterprise layer and what the characteristics needed there, mm -hmm. then all these become applications that mm -hmm. are built on top and provided as uh, solutions of their software as a service to uh, customers. Talked a lot about the the demand driven. Um, the data latency, what it is, the technology. I think the viewers would appreciate having a little bit of an example. Can you walk us through one? So, yeah, so, uh, you know, it, as you and I have co-authored the first paper, we've also co-authored this new paper on the effects of uh, system-based lead time or data latency. Um, as part of that, I, I built a model around the scenario of uh, two different PCs being introduced into the market uh, and in the white paper you'll see a nice little graphic and actually I think we can probably put it up as part of this presentation but what it shows is that but the basic scenario is that they forecasted both these different PCs to sell about equally mm -hmm. and what ends up happening is PC1 in the scenario starts selling at a significantly higher rate. PC2 is a, a slow mover. So, in the business as usual scenario, what you what you'll see is that, that there's a huge amount of lost revenue opportunity because they didn't they didn't have the agility or the supply chain agility or flexibility to react to that uh, chain or with that demand that they didn't forecast. Right. So in that, you know, in the case of the first PC, there was a huge uh, lost sales opportunity, and then going into month two, they were didn't have an inventory position proper to meet the next month's demand. In the case of P, the second PC, they had way too much inventory because they weren't reacting to what the demand was, so they kept building I keep talking about the you know the floating warehouse from China. They were building the wrong product, putting it on, and it was coming over. And even though the market didn't need it, so in the demand-driven scenario, what you'll see is that as in the case of the first PC, is you recognize the the trend in the actual demand that it's significantly higher. That in a supply chain that's optimized and Agile can react to that and all of a sudden start building the right product, stopping, <laughs> you know, and by the way, I, I did make it constraint-based, um, which you'll be able to see in the paper, but so we didn't go over the capacity of the, the factory. But instead of, you know, still building to this forecast that turned out not to be based in reality, they started building to the reality, which was we need a lot more PCA, we don't need any more PCB. Mm -hmm. The bottom line on the demand-driven side was that there was no lost sales, and that going in to month two, the inventory position was almost ma almost matched perfectly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And had I actually run it more of a real time, you know, in a 
what could be done on a daily basis instead of multiple days, I, it would have shown that it would have been exactly matched. And, um, and then in the case of the second uh, PC, because we recognized early that it wasn't moving, when you send that instantaneously back to the factory, they stop building that. So now instead of, you know, what's being brought over, including A and B, now it was a bunch of A coming over. So, of course, there was no lost sales because there was too much inventory, but going into the second month, the inventory position was almost perfectly matched to meet the demand for the second month. So, I guess the, the moral of the story is the earlier you recognize that, mm -hmm. the more accurate you are into telling your manufacturing what to build, and then the, the more options you have is that inventory is deploying forward as to where you put that to make sure that it uh, meets the actual demand. Yeah. And the numbers uh, do prove that out because the case study is based on some reality about what happens in the supply chain, and you can see it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I wanted to actually show you some real life examples, uh, or at least a real life example of a major consumer products company and mm -hmm. a very large retailer, and the types of results that they saw. <clears throat> so it's really a testament to what we had said. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, the industry average was roughly 60 days from raw material to shelf. They, in this company, they brought it down to as low as 20, mm -hmm. which has had the mm -hmm. effect of lowering their inventory by 30 percent, mm -hmm. and it's also had the effect of lowering the retailer, the tangential effect or the additive uh, benefit to the retailer having. Uh, inventories for that uh, for that customer uh, reduced by up to 50 percent. Wow! Now, and the, the interesting thing to point or to show in this slide is that the fill rates, or what was you know, the customer service level, what was that, uh, on, <clears throat> on the shelves at the time? You can see it's kind of varying pretty uh, well. It's varying over time, and as they've implemented and once they went live with the demand-driven strategy, not only did the service level to go up to over 90, over 99 percent, mm -hmm. but the variability of that stayed between the 90 and 99, 99 point, excuse me, 99 and 99 point five. So mm -hmm. it uh, had the huge benefit of reducing costs, increased service, and also increase or decrease the variability of what was yeah, it's very impressive, and I, you know, as I think about it, how to suggest people move forward. When we do supply chain assessments, basically as is, what's the current state? Uh, we always want to measure time, cost, and quality. Typically, we want to, we can measure the cost, the quality, meaning service levels, and so forth, and, and accuracy. Time always gets measured and just sits there; it doesn't mm -hmm. really get reduced. So now we've got the technology to actually reduce time, just like we do cost, and just like we improve quality. So it's very powerful. And that's what I was going to suggest for the viewers. You know, when you bring the right technology into play with the right business processes, amazing things can happen, as you, as you said, Doug. And we can also do things like postponement and personalization, and so much can be done with dealing with data latency uh, and so on. So, our suggestion for moving forward is to look at your supply chain in terms of the time, cost, and quality, current state, um, and make that assessment of how much time is it actually taking through the various steps, as Doug explained, uh, from supplier to customer, and look at that and try to measure what's actual, and that's the physical, well actually what's physical and what's systems. Right which equal sum together is actual, actual. Get those measures and then have a look at what we can do to reduce that system lead time because as Doug pointed out, it's, it's in many cases the same as the actual lead time. Absolutely. And in some cases more. Yeah. Yep. So we said we would discuss um, demand supply chains and reducing lead times, how uh, lead times affect supply chains, how cloud and network technology can be uh, employed now to really create so much opportunity. I think we did that. We discussed, um, we provided, well, you went through the anatomy of lead time, what really does make up lead time, which I think is really important for people uh, viewing. 
we talked about, you talked about the new technology, and then you gave a couple examples, which is really good, of the power of this technology employed properly. So hopefully people will, will want more information. So for more information, we refer you to our joint paper, and you see the link on the screen to that. And, and we also refer you to either of our company websites, uh, both One Network Enterprises and Tompkins International websites. And um, hope you enjoyed the, the webinar and this video uh, cast, and let us hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. Good.